there weren't too many people around. We were at best a group of 25 families living together as a community. My favorite memory growing up was climbing and jumping trees with my friends Veer and Jamal. Each of us had our own ability and we'd pretend to be superheroes on a quest to save the world. For instance, my athletic belt meant I could climb any tree no matter how challenging. Veer was known for his stealth. Our adventures came with a tinge of trespassing or stealing. Naturally, Veer was our best bet to cover our footprints. Jamal knew Malgudi inside out, which meant he was great at strategizing and deciding what quest to go on. But even otherwise, I had a mundane childhood. I didn't have much to look forward to, apart from going on adventures with my friends. Education was limited. The paths my life could take were also limited. I don't think I thought about my life or challenged it until we died. I was 17 at the time. He had contracted a viral fever that wouldn't go away. Doctors were never close by back then and his family didn't have enough money to take him to the city for his treatment. His death destroyed my assumptions about life. Life was no longer predictable. It's certainly never how you plan for it to unfold. Knowing I could die any moment, I needed to build a new philosophy. It was during this time that I was desperate for an epiphany to save me or change me. What a shame it is to die young. Veer and I had a strong desire to explore the world to its fullest, to see different places, people and perspectives. I knew I needed to do something about this to honor his death and my dreams. I decided to take a break from staying at Malgudi and head out. In the beginning, this was a form of escape. The people I met along the way didn't have much to say about my plight. I was loitering around Arampur when I met Umana. She had said something that changed my mind. Her idea was simple. Imagine how fun it could be if people were immortal. I prompted her to tell me more about it. Munna said to me that growing up, she was often told stories of cancer, a god or Satan who could convert people into immortals. The price was a barter. You exchanged your soul to live a life undisturbed by death, to live a life where you can fulfill your dreams. I was naturally curious to know if cancer was still around. Romer has said that he is an immortal himself. Munna gave me the nearest location where Kansa was last seen and told me that bringing him a token as a gift would be polite. He's an old grump and doesn't like having visitors. Fair enough, I thought to myself. And so I set off to find Kansa at Kittur. The journey to Kittur was exciting. I saw mountains for the first time. I also saw valleys and multiple river streams. I met different types of people, some young, some old. Some had art on their bodies, some had colored hair, and some with piercings. This was so much different from life in Malgudi, where people look alike. Turns out many people have heard of cancer, and he's not just a myth narrated to children during their bedtime stories. They told me many things about him. What Kansa likes, dislikes, pet peeves, and the like. For instance, Kansa enjoyed reading books to the point of physical disintegration. Books seemed like a great gift to give him. He hated small talk and people who always tried to be sarcastic. When I located his doorstep, I had a 
ideas without hesitation comes up pulled out a pen and demanded i show my index finger for a tiny prick i stood there confused kansa asked what the matter was and i responded by saying i was afraid the prick would hurt that was the first time i saw kansa burst into laughter it was slightly terrifying you came all the way here to barter your soul for 
was also the first time people suspected my age because I looked too youthful for someone to be in their late thirties. It's an easy escape and you're around people you barely know. But I doubted complimenting my genes and dodging the conversation would work back in Malvadi. Perhaps I'll never get to return home. Once the Great Wall of China was over, I travelled across Asia. I visited Hong Kong and then Singapore. Both these places had rapid technological advancements. I was certain time would play catch up with how advanced these cities were becoming. I made a pit stop in Turkey before deciding where to go next. Every corner of Istanbul fostered cats, and I spent a lot of time with merchants who knew how to run businesses. Unfortunately, I learned the hard way that I'm allergic to cat fur and spent a fortune on getting myself treated. I knew I had to leave Turkey. People there are ruled by cat lords, and it would be disastrous if I continued to stay there. It wasn't long before I ended up in Russia. I was fascinated by its government. People in positions of power have remained there for decades. I wanted to know the secret. Not long after, I worked as a secret agent for the KGB. I was tasked with spying on high-profile people with a lot of money, who in turn had a lot of influential power. We even had the right to pull the trigger on someone if they were bad-mouthing the government. I'm not sure I enjoyed KGB's risk to people's lives, including myself. I could face a penalty if I chose to let someone walk away, but the job also came with its perks. For instance, I could eat at any top Russian hotel, and the government would pay the tab. I've seen music performances of my life that I couldn't believe. It was around this time I met the love of my life, Mary, and working for the government. We met at the local supermarket, and right off the bat, there was something very interesting about her. I had never felt that way about anyone. Definitely not at first sight. We took the same subway home and started a conversation on our way. Our love was unlike anything. We barely even spoke the same language, but it was romantic to laugh in Hindi and be loved in Russian. Thanks to Mehdi, a few months into winning her heart, I also got a good grasp of the Russian language. This proved eventful in multiple ways. While I knew my love with Mehdi was not meant to last forever due to my immortality, and I get the irony. Understanding Russian only opened my eyes to how boring its politics were. I realized that life as a KGB agent isn't as fun and mysterious as the world made it out to be. I also kept falling sick throughout the time I lived in Russia. I blamed its cold weather and snow for making me feel weak and small. I decided to quit the KGB. Given I knew government secrets, the bureaucrats gave me two options. The first option was to continue working for the KGB without thinking about quitting again. The second choice wasn't much of an option. They threatened to murder me if I walked away from the KGB. Two days later, I found myself in an abandoned dark alley where the KGB brought me for my execution. I knew I was an immortal, but I was still nervous and thrilled to find out if their gunshot could hurt me. After a few banal exchanges, the KGB pulled the trigger. I was shook by the bullet's velocity and remained lying on the floor, covered in a pool of blood. They dragged me around, and I held my breath till I heard their car engine rev. Then I swam to the shore. Pulled the bullet from my forehead, chucked it under water, and moved on. Turns out I was perfectly fine. After my time in Russia, I began losing interest in moving from one place to another. It was tiring and expensive. Better condition.
physicians didn't seem too fond of me. I was at the general physician's clinic every other day getting myself treated for a few 